Hi, this is Rabbi Chaim Kaufman. Welcome to our 145th installment in the Torah portion of the week. We are holding by Parsha's Kisavo, a packed Parsha, like most of them are. It speaks about the first fruits, the Bikurim, right, that are brought on Shavuos, that are brought to the temple. It speaks about the decoration, what you're supposed to say by the Bikurim. And we have the confession of the tithes. We have the new commitment, the Jewish people. We have the blessing and the curses, right? Curses, unfortunately, you know, take up a good part of the Parsha um, as well. So I want to speak about something, you know, I think is important because it's definitely important. You're going to see that chapter 29, after all the curses, the Torah says Moshe summoned all of Israel and said to them, beginning of chapter 29, verse 1, says, you have seen everything the Shem did before your eyes in the land of Egypt. The Pharaoh, all his servants, all his land, great trials that your hearts beheld, the great signs and wonders, verse 3. But Shem did not give you a heart to know, eyes to see, or ears to hear until this day. Led you 40 days in the wilderness, garment didn't wear out from on you, your shoe did not wear out from on your foot. <coughs> Bread did you not eat, wine or intoxicant you did not drink, so you were no I am Shem your God. Then you arrived at the place, Sihon, king of, he of Heshbon, oh, king of Boshon, went out toward us to battle, and we killed them. We took their land, gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenite, the Gadites, half the tri tribe of Manasseh, of the Manassites. You shall observe the words of the covenant so that you will succeed in all that you do. So that is, again, chapter 29, verses 1, 2, 8. So, why, so why, why do I single this out? So I single this out for one very simple reason, and then we're gonna we're gonna you know delve into it, and that is that this is a proof. This is an absolute proof that God's in charge. God runs the world, and that the Torah must be true. Why? Because you have to remember if you go back to Exodus. Right, Exodus 19. Where they arrive at Mount Sinai. Right, third month when the Exodus children of Israel from Egypt. They arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. They they journeyed from Rephidim, come to the wilderness of Sinai, etc. And Moshe comes and summons the elders of the people, verse 7, puts all these words that should have commanded him. And the entire people said, Nah, seven Ishma, everything God says we shall do. And then we will hear. And then brought it back to Shem, to God. And he says, I'm going to come to you with the thickness of the cloud, blah, blah, blah. And we get Exodus chapter 20. God gives 10 commandments, right, to the Jewish people. So we have to understand, right, how many people did God speak to? So he spoke to 3 million people, between 2 and 3 million people. Between the ages of 20 and 60, the, we're talking about there were 600,000 men between the ages of 20 and 60, not including women and children. They're talking about 2 to 3 million people. So that being said, this has never been duplicated in history. right? We know no other nation is duplicated because it would be a hard thing to make, to make up. Every other, every other so-called religion you know, had their prophet come and do miracles in front of a few people, right? The Jewish people, or the Torah itself, speaks about the fact that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people in front of everybody, right? No one makes such a claim. I remember when I was in South America, in Chile, that it's the second biggest place of Mormons outside of Salt Lake City. I'm not exactly sure how they got to Chile. But I had these two Mormon guys come they come to my house trying to convince me, you know, why, you know, what they say is true and whatever. You know, in the end, in the end, they can't convince me. They say, well, don't you believe, don't you believe the fact, an amazing story that, that the Book of Mormon was hidden for 200 years. Comes along John Smith and he finds his Book of Mormon, right, it's hidden in some cave, dug it up, got the big Book of Mormon. I said, well, did you ever read the book of Exodus chapter 20? Got a better story. 
God spoke to the entire Jewish nation. Right, it's really, it's really chapter 19. Then he speaks in front of he, that he gathers everyone together and he speaks to the entire nation. All right, we get the Ten Commandments, chapter 20. So I said, well, isn't that a better story? 600,000 members were aged in 20 and 60. So you're talking about two to three million people. Right, that, that's better than your story. Right, 200 years, the book's hidden in a cave, someone comes to discover it. I mean, this story makes you look like nothing. So how do I know that's true? Right, how do I know anything in the Torah is true? Well, we know that if we find an inconsistency, plenty of them, plenty of them in Christianity, historical inaccuracies, genealogical inaccuracies, other things don't make any sense. Right, the one time you have a flaw in any of this, it's game over. Right, it must mean that it's not true. So someone will ask, someone will ask, how do I know the Torah is true? Right, so we say, that we, it's been passed down, generation, generation, person had a Passover Seder, goes to a Passover Seder every year, used to be four generations, right, the Passover Seder, great grandfather, grandfather, father and the son, four generations, and there's obligation, father to tell the son the story of Passover, how did the father know the story, because his father told him the story, how did his father know the story, because his father told him the story, normally, a parent's not going to lie to a child, maybe not in this generation, but normally, Parents certainly not going to lie to a child. And we know that everywhere you go, all around the world, the 15th of Nisan, there are going to be three matzahs, four cups of wine, cup for Elijah the prophet. Right, you're going to have matzah, you're going to have moror, you're going to have, you have bitter herbs, you're going to have haroset. Right, one event in history. So you might say, I mean, somebody may say, it's really, most people probably don't care. And most of their lives are based on desire anyway, so coming to exclude them. But if someone was really interested in truth, if someone would come and say that, how do I know the Torah is true? Right? How do I know it's accurate? How do I know what happened to Mount Sinai? The conservative movement says maybe they're all divinely inspired. Right? Maybe they all ate the same hallucinogenic mushroom in the desert. Maybe. Right? But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what does the Torah tell us? The Torah tells us what, what, what happened. What the history is. So the Torah tells us the Jewish people came to Mount Sinai. All the Jews were there. Three million people. Heard God face to face. Say, Hashem I am the Lord your God. Right, they died, came back to life. It could be they heard all the Ten Commandments. Only the two of them. Whatever the case is, they were there on Mount Sinai. Right? So we're going to come to exclude what the conservatives say. Well, we're not sure what happened. We know what happened. The Torah says black and white. God gave the Torah to the Jewish people. Right? Spoke to Moshe. Moshe passed it down. Right? But they saw God face to face in the mountain. Right? That much is clear. Now, if anything didn't happen, any of the miracles, or it's distorted, right? Nobody witnessed them. What have you? Because he's going to say we don't have any evidence, right? There's papyrus, certain, you know, certainly in Egypt that shows that the Jews were here. There were there were a lot of proof that the Jews were in Egypt at the time, and that the Jews escaped. But you're going to say, come on, that was a long time ago. Yeah, we don't know. We, we're we talking 2,000 years, 3,000 years earlier. So it's a lot of time. But then we go back to the Passover analogy. And I got 30, and I got four generations there. Right, the grandfather, the great grandfather, the grandfather, the father, and the son. So you need 80 of those generations to go back to Mount Sinai. That's not that many. All right, let's, let's, let's make it a little more graphic. All right, the great grandfather, let's say he's in his 80s. At one point, he was the youngest son at the Seder. Right? So now go back. Go back 80 years. Right? You go back 80 years. Now, when he was at the Seder, he also had a great-grandfather. So now you're going back another 80 years. It's already 160 years. Right? So now you're already in the late, in 1800s. Now, that great-grandfather was also the youngest son. Now go back another 150 years. 
Right, another 80 years. Sorry. Back in the 1700s. All right, goes back. You know, it's not that far back to get to the giving of the Torah. But comes along the Torah over here, and if none of the God, and if God forbid none of this happened, right, first of all, it wouldn't have been recorded. Or maybe it would have been recorded for one generation. Not even. But the Torah comes and says, You have seen everything God did before you. He's talking the generation that was there. Right? He's talking the generation that was there. You saw this. Not a bunch of drunks. Not three or four people. You. Three million people. You saw the Torah be given. Sorry. You saw what happened in Egypt. You saw these signs, these wonders. You saw the miracles. You witnessed the plagues. You were in the desert 40 years. You witnessed the fact that your garments didn't get destroyed. They didn't wear out. Your shoes didn't wear out. What food did you eat? You're in the desert. There's no, there's no bread, there's no wine. Right? There was manna. Whatever you wanted it to be. That's what it tasted like. God fed you miraculously in the desert. Right? Then, he, then you took out these two kings. And you wiped them out. But the point here. Right? And, and, and you know, this is something. This is something we need to, you know, for ourselves. You know, not just for secular Jews or non-Jews. We have to put it in our minds. That, that, you know, a person could be lax in their observance. They're like, well, you know, I should keep this. I should do this. But how do I really know anyway? How do I know that I have a connection? Right? I, I have that same connection to God. You know, the legitimate question. Right? We can all have a lapse in faith. We can all do things because, well, maybe we're going to fry now forever. Right, maybe that's why we'll do things. But you'll say the old adage, you're a link in the chain, goes back to Mount Sinai. Right, goes back to Mount Sinai. But how do I know? How do I know that's not a big game of telephone? How do I know this all transpired? Now, who's God talking to? God's talking to that generation. He's saying, you saw this and you saw that. And you saw the other thing. So what, what, did the, what did the parents of that generation tell their kids? Their kids saw it. So when this, those kids grow up, what are they going to tell their kids? What they saw. And their kids, what they saw. So you're going to say, but hundreds of years later, maybe it's not going to be as strong. Maybe the fervor is not going to be as strong. That's true. There's what we call it. You read it's a diarus. A weakening of the generations. That's 100% true. But if it gets passed down. Because there were witnesses. Right? You could ask the question. How do I know the whole book is true? Well, obviously, if you find a flaw, then maybe it's not true. Right? But if Moshe Rabbeinu, at the end of his life, speaks to the Jewish people, and he tells them, this is exactly what you yourself saw. You didn't hear it from someone else. You didn't get it third hand. There weren't a bunch of drunks who saw it. Everybody saw what happened in Egypt? Because you survived. You came out. You saw when, what, what went on in the desert. The miracles. Your clothes didn't wear out. You had food. Right? You had the manna that God sent. So they gave that over to their kids. They reinforced it. 
their kids told it over to their kids that didn't see it. Now, why should the kids not believe them? Parents normally not going to lie to their kid. So the parent says, look what I've seen. You can't even imagine what it was. But I witnessed it. That's pretty credible. You know, and they give that over to their kids. And their kids give that over to their kids. So good, you might say, well, you know, your great-grandfather, this is what he saw. I never saw it. But these are the offshoots of what we have. Right, the observance, the mitzvahs that we do are based on what we went through, of what we saw, of the miracles. But you see, if it's all just about passing down legend, and passing down, what a strong feeling it is. But I didn't see it. I wasn't part of it. So if, it, so if only a feeling is passed down, that after so many generations, it gets cooled off. Because the person who didn't see it is not as vivid as the person who went through it. The person who went through it, it's all pomp and circumstance. Got to give it over like you can't imagine. Make a movie. Call it the Ten Commandments. Child Aston. You get the flavor of what it was. But you say, come on, this 3,000 years ago. Doesn't speak to me today. So that means you're lacking in education. But imagine if you were there. Right? Imagine if you were there. You'd be all excited. You'd be singing God's praises all the time. I mean, you have to understand what the Jews went through. And the difficulty that they had having proper faith and a lack of faith even at the greatest time in Jewish history. You know, where they're given the Torah and all the miracles. Right? Is it for another discussion? Or maybe we'll hit it a little bit. But if you saw it firsthand, what would you tell your kids? Year in and year out, you would tell them exactly what happened. You won't believe these frogs came. And they went all over Egypt, and these wild animals, and the lice, and all these things. They can say it with a fervor, with a brand, with a fire, because they saw it with their own eyes. But you see, something gets lost, you know, generations later. Second generation can still have that fervor, because they got the excitement from the parents. Third generation is already two steps removed. They may have heard it from their, from their grandparents. And it may make an impression. And depending on how the grandparents give it over, it'll stick maybe a little bit or whatever. And then they're going to give it over to their kids. But if they give it over to their kids, it's going to be with less fervor. And their kids will be with less fervor. Until eventually it gets forgotten. It's again to say something that powerful. Something that powerful that happened in history. How in the world could it be forgotten? You say, come on, 3,000 years later, what connection do I have? What connection do I have if there's nothing behind it? If it's only a feeling. And you're right. You know, as I told someone a few years back, you may have the feeling of Judaism, you don't practice very much, but you may have the feeling for Judaism, but guess what? You cannot pass that down to your kids. First of all, you don't understand what it is. So you have nothing to give over. But imagine if you learned the rich history. Imagine you went through a lot of the Talmud. You went through a lot of books in Jewish philosophy. You know what it means to be a Jew. You go through the holidays. You sit in a sukkah. You hear the shofar in Rosh Hashanah. You work on yourself. You learn Musa. You learn what the previous generation said. 
You have connection to great people in this generation. It's alive. That's the only reason it's alive and it stays alive. If it's just about a feeling, if it's just about, well, I'm going to go to synagogue, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, that's what you do. Suffer through the rabbi sermon, you sit in synagogue for a bunch of, bunch of hours, get together with family, you know, you may have a meal or two, and that's it. But you know, you get a drop of the flavor. Well, the person goes to reform or conservative synagogue, you get a drop of it. You know, maybe the theme is a little bit intense. But does it speak to you? Do you understand what it is? Do you understand Rosh Hashanah is about judgment? And the fact that there are people no longer with us. As we say in Musaf and the Unasan Asaykef, who by water, who by fire, who will be poor, who will be rich? Who's not going to be here? Mi yichyev, mi yamus. Who will live and who will die? That's why they're called days of awe. They're awesome days. Day of judgment, day of atonement. Now that being said, if a person goes to a place they don't really believe in it, they chop up the prayer book, they chop up other things, you get a small glimpse. A very watered-down glimpse that you have no connection to. Because the cancer gets up there, it's like opera. Can't really sing with him or her. It's like a performance. It's like being at the opera. If you like opera, very good. But if my goal is to reconnect to God and to reattach to Him, then how am I supposed to do it? How can I possibly do it with my little knowledge and hear a dime store drusha sermon from a Rava Gonat Sadik Moreno Verabeno? Dennis the Menace. Who are you going to hear about current events? I'm going to make it real. You know, it's going to hit home. You say, how am I supposed to connect? 3,000 years ago. But see, things we say in prayer, we recognize that God runs the world. Right? And a lot of things that are said are in present tense. Why is it present tense? To show God didn't just to make a, a world create something and disappear. Right? The question where an omnipresent being goes, Oh, there he is! Boo! Right? It's not about that. It's about an ongoing relationship. Right? It's about doing the right thing. It's about reward and punishment. It's about acknowledging God is king. What's the epitome of Rosh Hashanah? It's when we get on our hands and knees and bow in the famous Aleinu prayer. Right, the Leno prayer we say at the very end of Davin. The end of the, at the very end of our prayers. Right, we're only gonna bow down to you, nobody else, not that there's any false gods, blah blah blah. It's the epitome of what Rosh Hashanah is. It's about Malchus, that God runs the world, that God is in charge. And he can either give life or take life away. But you see, the world looks like it's run on autopilot, and it looks like total chaos. Evil people seem to have it easy. People that try and do God's will seem to struggle, have other issues. You look at the world and say, life's not fair. Why should this happen? Why should that happen? You know what the answer is? We don't know. We don't have any answers. 
I mean, we do. You know, there's reward and punishment. And if a child gets sick, it's not their fault. It must be payback. Right? For being reincarnated soul. For what their soul did before. But essentially, the bottom line is, is that God runs the world. And that God is in charge. And the reason we know is because there's a history. There's a connection. There's a connection to our past. Because our forefathers saw this. So if you go further back in time. And you were there. They would tell you. This is what my father told me. This is what his father told me. That's what Passover is. It's one of the greatest days of the year. About Amunah. About faith in God. Now he runs the world. And the fact that he's in charge. Because you got one event in time. That everybody does the same thing. Or should. Depending on how diluted it is. In every part of the world. But we talk in present tense. This is what happened. This is what your father said. Right? There's an obligation in the Torah. The Torah tells us. The God is in the The father has an obligation. Tells the story of the exodus to his son. You say, Dad, come on. I didn't know what happened. You weren't there. Right? Were you there? Your soul was there on Mount Sinai. Right, all the Jewish people, the souls were there. Because they come on, hocus pocus, Kabbalah. Right, so let's make it easy. Says the Torah over here. Moshe Rabbeinu says to that generation, because he says to all Israel, all the Jewish people, this is what you saw. He didn't make it up. Wasn't mirrors. Wasn't hocus pocus. I mean, could have been hocus pocus. God's hocus pocus. And you have miracle after miracle after miracle. It's not like you heard it third hand. Right? Like all these other so called religions. They saw it with their own eyes. So then we'll touch on a harder subject. And the harder subject is that they saw it with their own eyes. Why they complain? Why they complain in the desert? Why do they sin? Why do the spies sin? What's the story with Korach? Little faith. The faith didn't go as far as God wanted it to. Right? Remember, they had no food. So they got a double portion on Friday. Because they weren't supposed to gather on Shabbos. So, what happens? They got it yesterday. They got it the day before. Got it the day before that. Oh, Mother Hubbard, nothing in the cupboard. What's going to be tomorrow? So, their mentality was, how do I know we're going to have food tomorrow? Well, didn't God say he's going to take care of your needs? He did all these things up to this point. Why do they think it's not going to happen? So, God is testing them in their faith in him. But in the end, the reality is, that their faith is a little bit weak. Maybe they think they're going to do something to cause a sin. And therefore they're not going to be worthy. Not that they don't believe it's going to happen. But maybe they're not worthy. Be that as it may, we lose sight of what history has shown us. There's a famous story with an Arab terrorist. I told the story before. It's a good story. With an Arab terrorist. And he sees his jailer. Again, it's not a rock, this guy's not a Rhodes Scholar. Not a rocket scientist by any stretch. And he sees his, his Israeli jailer eating a sandwich on Passover. Bread! So it says it's Arab. Don't you know? It says in your Torah, you're not allowed to eat 11 products on Passover. Seven days. There, this jailer says... Come on, that happened 3,000 years ago, more. We're the new Israel. We're not told by these laws. I'm Israeli. So Zab made a calculation. 
And he said, if a Jew doesn't have a connection to his past, he has no future. Let's repeat that. If he has no connection to his past, he has no future. Which means, for this Arab, it's only a matter of time before they give the land back to us. Because no connection. Historical, historical, there's that. No connection. So how come we have this rich history? And you have 90% of the Jewish people who care less. Most of it is based on desire, okay. Right, they're probably not interested. This is true, it's not true. They don't want to be obligated to do things. Right, that's why they question what the rabbis say. Why not those are the rabbis? I don't want to make my life easier. Right, as it says in Shari Tshuva, in the case of repentance, Rabbeinu Yona. They don't want to listen to the rabbis because they want to make it easy. Oh, but that's not written in the Torah. That doesn't say that in the Torah. You're making up your own thing. So I don't have to keep it. I want to have it easier. And so I understand if they're not looking for truth. I understand they want to go according to desire. But even if someone were to throw out at you, and this is really the point here, and then, well, maybe it's just a big game of telephone. Someone who's interested in, in, in theory, they're thinking it may be true or not. They say, how do I know it's true? Because they saw things. Moshe wrote down what the entire nation saw. If the entire nation didn't see it, he can't write that. It's a lie. If it's only said by a few people that witnessed it, who says it's accurate? Four people, six people. Is that the same as three million? That passed that down? So if you think about it in historical terms, and you you know, let's let's draw the picture here. Moshe Rabbeinu himself speaking to the entire Jewish nation. And Moshe Rabbeinu does not say, This is what I saw. This is what Aaron saw. This is what the elders saw. Moshe Rabbeinu summons all of Israel. And he says to them, You have seen everything that Hashem has done before your eyes in the land of Egypt. The Pharaoh, all the servants, all his land. You, not me, not just me, not just Aaron. You and the entire nation. Someone could argue. Okay, how do I know that's true? Just because it says it doesn't mean it's true. Okay, then you have to go back. Then you have to go back and say, okay, are these things self-evident? Are the myths that we keep? Why do we keep them? All right, where do they come from? Are there other things in the Torah that are true? But see, this means one of the major tenets of Judaism is that God intervenes in history. No one denies that. None of the Jewish people here deny it. So 3,000 years later, when people have a crisis in faith, different things go on, and they say, gee, how do I know it's true? Well, there are other proofs. I know my job to try and prove it. There are other proofs that the Torah has to be true. But what about the pride in history? What about all the good things that God did? This is why I can't relate to it. You know why I can't relate to it? Because you never tried. You know, did you actually try and keep the Torah the way it should? Keep Shabbos the way it should? Don't speak Lashon Hara. Don't do these other things. Put yourself in a certain mentality. Live amongst people that believe. That makes your belief stronger. Whether things are easier, whether things are harder. You know, at the end of the day, 
the fact that the entire Jewish nation, not just part of them, not just a few of them, the entire Jewish nation gives credence to this fact. They saw it. They witnessed it. And their kids saw it. So somewhere along the line, things got a little bit watered down. Other things took Jewish people away from Torah, anti-Semitism, pogroms, boons, socialism, democracy. It doesn't negate the fact that the Torah is not true. But in the end, it's a lot more interesting. Or people think it's a lot more interesting. Reading these books and, you know, forbidden fruits are always more sweet. It's because they never got the enjoyment of what Torah is. They never got the geschmackkeit, we'll say in Yiddish. The enjoyment, the fervor of what Torah can be. Yeah, it can come at a high price also. Right, those are the great things that the Torah promises if we keep the Torah. But unfortunately, if you read the, the Kloas, you read the curses, a lot of these curses, unfortunately, have come true. So the Torah is telling you, yeah, you saw this and you saw that, you saw all the miracles. But you also saw the other negative things. In future generations, we'll see that. You saw that 80% didn't come out of, out of Egypt. There's a right way, there's a wrong way. But the sad part is, is that the majority of Jews, you come to this passage, which they'll never read, but you come to this passage and say, what a history. Right? What an unbelievable history the Jewish people have. And look what was witnessed. Right, so someone will ask you, how do you know it's true? Right, there are other proofs as well. But you can say over here, this is what they saw. The entire nation. How could the entire nation be fooled? If you tell me it happened at night, only a few people saw it. Got to question it. Right, it's a major question. Maybe he did see it, maybe he didn't see it, but there's no proof. Passover Seder is great proof. Because they're telling the story, what happened. Because his father told him the story, and his father told him the story. How do I know it's true? Because it corroborates what, what the Torah says. Not to mention the fact we have other proofs, sociological, we have papyrus, other things. So there's ample proof out there. But I want people to remember that when a person has a hard day, you know, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's both, things don't seem to be going our way. You say, God, what's going on? What are you doing? Why is this happening? You know, maybe you say, well, God, are you there? Hello? Are you doing anything? Where are you? And you remember this mantra. God spoke, sorry, Moshe spoke to the entire Jewish nation. This is what the nation saw. These are the miracles that they saw. And they witnessed. Okay, so it could be. My time's not now. I'm supposed to go through certain things, whatever the case is. Doesn't mean God doesn't run the world. Doesn't mean he's not in charge. It doesn't mean the Torah's not true. But a lot of people don't care. That even if it's true, they're not going to change. I mean, this can't be made up. You cannot fool an entire nation. Some people, yes. An entire nation, no. The problem is our faith is weak. Our faith is weak for one very simple reason. 
because we don't know what we see. We don't appreciate, let's say better. We don't appreciate what we see. If we'd appreciate what we see and what we have, be a total different ballgame. I life is hard in different ways, okay? You know, they say, as they say in the vernacular Hebrew here, life is no picnic. Right? Life's not supposed to be easy. But see, people don't want to get bogged down. People want to be free. People just want to do what they want. They don't want to take responsibility. Which is the entire opposite of what Torah is. I mean, I would venture to say, this is what Moshe says. This is what Moshe says to the Jewish people. And that they all witness it. They all hear it. So how can it be you're going to drop out? And you're going to say, I'm not interested. If you didn't grow up that way. How can you just say, well, I can't believe it's true. This, that, and the other thing. Because we're lazy. You know, why do we say, oh, it's the rabbis this, the rabbis that. Why should I listen to them? It's an excuse. Because you know what the excuse is? The excuse is... It doesn't say that in the Torah. It's you saying whatever. But isn't there a mitzvah to listen to the rabbis in every generation? Right? S says... Oops. Says Shari Tshuva... Beginning of Shar Shlishi. Says the Mitzvah to listen to the rabbis. Torah tells us, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 11. Don't veer from what they say left or right. Whatever they tell you. Don't veer from what they say left or right. Whatever they tell you. Well, that's that being the case. What the rabbis tell us we have to do. There's an obligation to do. Right? If there's an obligation to do, I have to keep it to the best of my ability. Right? I certainly have to keep it to the best of my ability. But I can push it off and say, oh, it doesn't say that in the Torah. It says the Shari Chuba, it says Rabbeinu Yonah. Yeah, it's an excuse. The excuse is because I want life to be easy. But that doesn't deny the fact that the Torah is true. It doesn't deny the fact that God spoke to Moshe and Moshe said, you saw this with your own eyes. Can't deny that. Three million people? Well, the matter happened 3,000 years ago. It's ample proof that the Torah is true. So even we're going through difficult times, whatever it is, we got to remember where it comes from. We have to remember what the Jewish people have been through. And why we have an obligation to keep it. And why we should pass it down to our kids. So I want to remind people that I have a question and answer session every Tuesday and Thursday. It's at um, 10 o'clock in the morning, New York time, 5 o'clock Israel time. You can ask, you know, anything you want. Uh, it's live on Facebook and Zoom. I have a class, Duties of the Heart. Hovos uh, Vavovos. We are in Shara B'Tachon about faith in God, speaking about livelihood and how God runs the world. It's every Tuesday, 9 o'clock uh, New York time. And I have classes in conversion, right, twice a week. On Sunday and on Thursday, another class I have on Facebook and Zoom that is on the book of Leviticus chapter 10 every Sunday, 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, New York Times. Anyone who wants to contact me, find me on Facebook, Beyond Orthodox Conversion and Judaism, you can send me an email, rabbichaimkoffin at gmail.com, R-E-B-B-I-C-H-A-I-M-C-O-F-F-M-A-N at gmail.com. Wishing everyone a great Shabbos.